Become a Patreon supporter of the Kubrick series and enjoy advanced access to future episodes and our complete archive of uncut interviews. Visit thekubrickseries.com or patreon.com slash thekubrickseries for more details. Over the course of 13 feature films, he examined a diverse range of topics and themes, from the glories and dangers of technology... I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. ...to the moral conflicts inherent in war. Whose side do you want, son? Our side, sir. How about getting with the program? He investigated the duality of man with unblinking honesty... <laughs> ...with a fierce intelligence... He embraced the ambiguous, revealing deeper layers of truth with every viewing of his work. You've always been the caretaker. His films were of their time, ahead of their time, and timeless. I'm not saying we wouldn't get our hair mussed, but I do say no more than 10 to 20 million killed, tops. In this series, we will examine the works of Stanley Kubrick, works that will continue to challenge, fascinate, and exhilarate audiences for as long as there are movies. This is the Kubrick Series. Episode 4, Picture Imperfect. Gentlemen. Barry's father had been bred, like many other young sons of a genteel family, to the profession of the law. And there is no doubt he would have made an eminent figure in his profession had he not been killed in a duel. One of those movies that helps me escape into a place and really spend a few hours just away from my own world. Stanley was notorious for throwing a wrench in the work where he would suddenly decide that this scene that we talked about and rehearsed, literally the morning of shooting it, suddenly decided to put the scene on horseback. He was the closest that I ever came to working with a director for film or television, uh, the way the director worked with actors on stage. It's been called the most beautiful film ever made, a landmark in the history of cinema the greatest costume epic ever committed to film. It's also been deemed an ice pack of a movie, distant and devoid of heart and tangible human emotion. But as the decades have passed, many people are rediscovering the magic of Barry Lyndon and claiming it as Kubrick's forgotten masterpiece. Sumptuously photographed, and intoxicating in its authentic rendering of the period, Barry Lyndon is perhaps Kubrick's most accomplished, deeply felt, and emotionally violent film. Timeless in their nature, and complex in their ideas, themes, and structure, Kubrick's films always lend themselves to critical reassessment. Never is this more true than with Barry Lyndon. Kubrick's longtime assistant, Tony Fruin, he used to say it's uh, it's easier to fall in love than find a good story, and all of his films are about are, are about are good stories, and it's the story, a story that said something that goes somewhere that appealed to him. I mean, whether it happened to be you know set in Vietnam or out of space, I mean, I, I don't think it really mattered to him. The vast majority of Kubrick's working life consisted of combing through thousands of volumes in an attempt to find the perfect story from which to base his next film. Following A Clockwork Orange, Kubrick began to read a set of Thackeray novels that had been sitting on his shelf for years. At first, he played with the notion of adapting Vanity Fair, but then, the luck of Barry Lyndon caught his eye. I love the story and the characters, he said, and it seemed possible to make the transition from novel to film without destroying it in the process. Screenwriter, director, and playwright, Neil Labute. 
a novel from that period. I mean, to go back and look at those novels, look at a Vanity Fair or mm. Tom Jones or or a, or a book like this, really dense and and you know flowery, not even poetic, but just flowery the language, and to, to to cut such a clear narrative over such a a long film, uh, mm. I, I thought he handled it extremely well. Critic Glenn Kenny. It's not Zachary's best-known novel. I think his best-known novel is Vanity Fair, which has been uh, made into uh, a number of films that have very little to do with uh, with Zachary's uh, actual vision. I think you know this is uh, people have, have talked of Zachary as a satirist. He's you know he's not a satirist in the in the mode of Swift, who was very polemical, but he is an ironist of, of the of the social mores of the time, and I think that appeals to uh, to Kubrick. You know, his um, he didn't collaborate with Terry Southern overtly on more than one film, but you know, I think his sensibility and Southern's sensibility were very similar, and it was in fact Southern's suggestion that Kubrick read Clockwork Orange, and it's a bit of a stretch to say that Thackeray was the Terry Southern of his time, obviously, but you know they had a, there's a similar concern in the works with uh, with uh, with uh, mocking the uh, the hypocrisies and it, with that within within the social mores and practices of the time. So it's very it's a the sardonic edge. Uh, you know, Thackeray's more sardonic than Dickens. He's less sentimental than Dickens, and that uh, certainly appeals. You know, Kubrick is. Uh, among other things, about the least sentimental mainstream conventional narrative filmmaker. Originally published in serial form in 1844, and later revised for novel publication and retitled The Memoirs of Barry Lyndon Esquire of the Kingdom of England, William Thackeray's The Luck of Barry Lyndon falls in line with several key notions that Kubrick returned to time and again, mainly the darker and more self-centered side of human nature, and the cruel inevitability of fate. First love. What a change it makes in a lad. What a magnificent secret it is that he carries about with him. The tender passion gushes instinctively out of a man's heart. He loves as a bird sings, or a rose blows, from nature. I have taken the ribbon from around my neck and hidden it somewhere on my person. If you find it, you can have it. You are free to look for it any way you will, and I will think very little of you if you do not find it. Kubrick's film of Barry Lyndon traces the exploits of a slightly hapless English rogue as he moves his way from a young man of meager means to a member of English aristocracy and back again. A scoundrel, a gambler, a cheat, and a war deserter, Barry eventually meets the very wealthy Countess of Lyndon and convinces her to marry him to the consternation of her son, Lord Bullingdon. Well, Lord Bullingdon, you seem particularly glum today. You should be happy that your mother has remarried. He seems to me little more than a common opportunist. I don't think he loves my mother at all. And it hurts me very much to see her make such a fool of herself. Barry suddenly finds himself living the life of luxury and proceeds to spend vast amounts of her money, fawning a position in high society that runs contradictory to his oftentimes petty and meandering constitution. Tempers continue to flare between he and his stepson, who remains loyal to his deceased father, suspicious of Barry's motivations, and fiercely protective of his mother. If my mother had died would have been as much my responsibility as if I had poured the strychnine for her myself. For to the everlasting disgrace of my family name, I have by my cowardice and my weakness allowed the Barrys to establish a brutal 
and ignorant tyranny over our lives, which has left my mother a broken woman. Following the early tragic death of his own son by Lady Lyndon, Barry's marriage falls apart, and a broken Barry gives in to the demands of Lord Bullingdon, who insists upon a duel to the death. Mr. Redmond Barry, the last occasion on which we met, you wantonly caused me injury and dishonor in such a manner and to such an extent as to which no gentleman can willingly suffer without demanding satisfaction. Barry is gravely injured in this duel, and his leg is partially amputated as a result. Bullington reclaims his mother's good favor and takes over as caretaker of her estate, effectively pushing Barry out of their lives forever with the promise of a sizable monthly stipend. His body broken, his spirit tortured and damned, Barry is cast out and never again sets his eyes upon Lady Linden. The final shot of the film shows the lady signing one of Barry's monthly annuity checks, a blank but haunted expression shrouding her face, as a satisfied Lord Bullington looks on. A closing title card echoes a sentiment commonly found in Kubrick's work. It was in the reign of King George III that the aforesaid personages lived and quarreled, good or bad, handsome or ugly, rich or poor, they are all equal now. In many respects, this final message recalls the last line spoken by Sterling Hayden in Kubrick's 1960 heist film, The Killing. What's the use? Author of Stanley Kubrick, Seven Films Analyzed, Randy Rasmussen. You have a little postscript that Kubrick inserts that you know, Kubrick's way of leveling the playing field, you know. It's just a little reminder that you're, we're all in the same boat the past three hours where he spent showing all this inequality and the struggle for power within that, uh, that sort of closed social world. That the world itself was about to come to an end. Not only the individuals, not only Redmond Barry, who sort of disappears from sight at the end, but Lord Bullington, all of them, they're gone, but also that whole system was on the verge in 1789 of, of a radical restructuring or whatever you want to call it, partial destruction. Critic Keith Ulick. It's really harsh and yet it is moving in closer and it does bring you closer and then, and, and, you know, and then it brings you close and when you get there you get like these really raw bursts of emotion at times. And oftentimes I think the effect is that he, he's, that he's holding back and then he's going to unleash it at just the right time. Pa. Am I going to die? No, my darling, you're not going to die. You're going to get better. But I can't feel anything except in my hands. Does that mean I'm already dead in part of my body? No, my darling, it's where you were hurt by the horse. But you're going to be all right now. Papa, if I die, will I go to heaven? Of course you will, my darling. But you're not going to die. Some people would never go. We promise. 
whenever you tell me the story about the fort. Of course. We crept upon the fort. And I jumped over the wall first. And my fellows jumped after me. And you should have seen the look on the Frenchman's faces when 23 rampaging heat devils, sword and pistol, cut and thrust pell-mell came tumbling into the fort. In three minutes' time, we left. I mean, I don't think there is any really released emotion in the film. It's like all held back, and yet it all builds to that moment of just just Lady Linden just kind of like seeing Barry's name on the on the check on the checkbook, you know, that she's going to write the check to. And there's like this. It's just kind of like you want her to release, to release, to release, and she doesn't do it. And and that you know, in confidence, everything that came before it just just destroys you you know and i get to the end of that and it's like all the three hours of build up it's like you know out comes this this river flow acclaimed cartoonist and writer tim Kreider. but i remember once seeing barry linden in a theater and when barry linden finally hauls off and kidney punches his hateful nephew the whole audience applauded so awesome to see um guys in 18th century stockings uh in a kind of pile up um but also because it's the return of the repressed, you know? It's, it's like when Alex is cured at the end of Clockwork Orange. You see this character who's been rendered hatefully passive um, mm-hmm. become gloriously uh, homicidal again. Film professor Steve Mamber. I truly deeply love Barry Lyndon, and I think yes. uh, the, the more you become a fan of Kubrick, the more important Barry Lyndon uh, becomes, because uh, it is amazing to see somebody who... Uh, you know, so often is associated with modern themes or uh, modern technology or, uh, you know, he uh, I think it's more associated with uh, 2001 and Clockwork Orange. And the point of uh, Barry Lyndon is that, you know, humanity has always been this way. It hasn't changed. And we could see exactly the same kind of uh, kind of world there. You know, now it's tracking shots in castles. And now it's a, a duel that gets played over and over again, but it's exactly the, the same kind of world. So uh, mm-hmm. when Barry when Barry Lyndon uh, ends with again ironic narration saying uh, we're all equal now, which means basically uh, uh, they're all dead now, you know it, it's uh, absolutely the same kind of uh, Kubrick world. So. Um, it is, of course, so staggeringly beautiful that yeah. film. My God, some of the shots in uh, in Barry Lyndon, you just want you want them to last forever because they're yeah. so beautiful. Yeah. But the uh, the great problem of Barry Lyndon, of course, is uh, uh, the world is so beautiful, but the world is so horrible at the mm-hmm. at the same time mm-hmm. uh, as well. So, of course, it's uh, you know look at this art and look at these castles and look at these uh, you know incredible overhead shots of uh, you know the most beautiful ma- la- landscapes. Uh, imaginable but but all of the people are are horrible author randy rasmussen i i really like barry linden um he i don't he doesn't like to it's like every movie he makes in some respects maybe only aesthetically is kind of a reaction against the movie he made before and of course a clockwork orange is a ruthlessly modern as of that time and contemporary and has the contemporary look to it and and um, postulates a society that's very, very, the individual can get by with an awful lot of stuff. <laughs> and I think he wanted to go to a new area that's very different. And Barry Lyndon was that. The, the struggle for power and mastery over one's own life and fortunes is the same in a sense, in Barry Lyndon, as it is in Clockwork and others, or, or 2001 for that matter, you know, Dave and Frank trying to get along in outer space with Hal. But it's it's aesthetically so different mm-hmm. that things, you know, you're not going to solve everything with a punch or a stab, whatever, or, or a bit of ultraviolence. There are moments like that in Barry Lyndon, but they're rare and they're shocking because they're so rare. 
Um, and of course, Barry himself, Redmond Barry, is at least to start with, he is a much nicer human being. He's a more noble human being than than Alex is at the beginning. Of clock, mm-hmm. so that's a very different. And um, of course, he becomes a bit corrupt. But even later on, he has moments when when he kind of redeems himself, sometimes at the cost of his own control over his life. You know, he could have killed Lord Bullington at the end because Lord Bullington misfires during their duel. He has the first shot. He miss, It's Barry's shot. He could have killed him. He's very good at dueling. We know that. He takes pity on the kid, and it costs him. Screenwriter, director, and playwright, Neil LeBute. He had just come off a of Clockwork Orange. Barry Lyndon stylistically is very, very different. Uh, but there is a thread of emotional violence in mm. the film, uh, and it reminds me of uh, Scorsese's Age of Innocence in a way, and how he dealt with the costume drama, and I'm sure that he was influenced by Lyndon. That's one of his favorite films. Yeah. Uh, do, do, you, do you see that in, in Barry Lyndon as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, for, for every for every you know um, battle, you know, and, and, and I think it's it's that that the austerity of it, you know, the the sort of um, the duel, the, the the marching into battle, you know, uh, the, the kind of madness with which they used to, um, you know, not that not that hiding in the trees and, and shooting at each other is any more civilized, but there was something about you know sending a row of men, you know, to their death that way. Um, that was that that you know seemed so chivalrous and 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 so um, gentlemanly and yet so kind of barbaric in its own way. Um, mm. But the kind of that the, the, the way just the the way that he shot the um, the bare knuckle fist fight, you know, in in the military scenes, the mm-hmm. um, the, the beating that he gives the um, uh, Lord Bullington. Um, but 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 you know the psychological warfare that these people waged on each other. Um, there's it's, you know he he handles that so well. He he creates a sense of menace, and I'm sure that, that I would imagine if I read enough that that Pinter would have been an admirer of Kubrick. Um, you know, created that same kind of of air of you know that that sense that something bad was going to happen. He never knew when it was going to you know kind of break out of. Uh, the boundaries of of civility and become become something more. Author Randy Rasmussen. Do you think he's making a statement about the institution of class in Barry Lyndon? Definitely, definitely. I think his uh, side, uh, when he does attain status, marries Lady Lyndon, and lives in this fabulous palace, um, he tells. Uh, bedtime stories to his son about mm-hmm. the war, and they are hopelessly glamorized, idealized. You know, he is the hero. He's not a deserter, which is what he was. He's not uh, forced into service the way he was in, in the German or the Prussian army. He, he's he's the king's hero. He uh, lops off the heads of the enemies, and he's. So once he attains status, then it's in his interest to reinforce the uh, the status quo, I guess, or the powers that be. Same thing with his attitude towards Lady Lyndon. I mean, as soon as he becomes master of the house, almost, not quite financially, he kind of treats her like dirt. And I think the narrator conveys to us that he um, he favored a very quiet life for his wife. Mm. after she uh, bore him a son. Well, of course he does, because he's playing around with everyone else. <laughs> so in order to keep her in his play, in, in the place he wants her for that time, he's very much in favor of the tradition that keeps the woman there in the house, occupied with her children. Yeah. It's only later on when he apologizes to her that she seems to come out of her shell and things are a little better between them, but that's because he seems to have a natural goodness about him that resurfaces even though he's acting like a cad. I, I, I didn't feel him, him judging people. I, I felt him, mm-hmm. you know, watching. Director Neil LeBute. If anything, he could be a little distanced, you know, and 
sometimes that just made for a great image, you know. But I, I think that he, um, I think Barry Lyndon's a perfect example of that. You know, I don't think he looks at Barry, even at a moment where Barry is like beating his son or, you know, at, at, his, at his highest point, you know, the, the opening of, he, he probably couldn't be more full of himself than after the intermission. You know, he's, I think it opens on them in a carriage ride and he's smoking a pipe and looks quite quite pleased with himself. I, I think that, um, you know, he, he he doesn't look at that person with disdain so much as, you know, a, a sense of, Again, amusement isn't right. But amusement isn't right either. It, it really is a, a kind of not quite scientific detachment, but I think a, a kind of godlike sense of, you know, I have put these these things into play and in order, and this is the, you know, uh, I'd like to see what happens here, you know, and mm-hmm. and and Barry Lyndon plays out as it was meant to play out, and um, and he he is left to the fate that he both deserves and brought upon himself and sometimes events are are greater than than the man he loved to explore the as as do you I, I would imagine through your work kind of the darker side of human nature and also there's something running through Barry Lyndon there's in a lot of his films this sort of inevitability that that his his, his fate is it's destined it's predestined for him almost I think there is that, you know, certainly there's the, you know, I mean, he makes his hand by by gambling and, and you know, fate plays a certain part, but there is this kind of wheel of fortune. That's, there's a kind of, in some of his best work, there's a, there's, a, there's certainly, you know, and maybe, maybe that's in some of the best work in, in the world, there's this case as well, but certainly you see it in the, in the hands of someone like him. You, you start to find themes, and, and there is that journey. You know, there's the, the same kind of journey that Alex takes in, in Clockwork Orange, you see happen throughout the, the story of Barry Lyndon, and you see in even the journey that, that uh, the character that Tom Cruise plays in, in Eyes Wide Shut, um, you know, and certainly there's, you know, journeys in, in into into darkness and, and sometimes out the other side and sometimes not um, for a lot of characters in, in, in pictures that... Uh, that Kubrick directed, but but um, yeah, I think certainly he he didn't shy away from from both sides of humanity, and and you know I, I think he he was amazed and amused by human beings and human nature. I don't, I, I never found him. Maybe it's because you know people have accused me of the same of being cynical, but I, I don't think of him in those terms. But I think he was you know very realistic about the capacity that we have for both good and bad. Critic Robert Horton. Even though it, the surface of it is cold, that's true, but it's it, it somehow at the end of spending three hours with this this character, um, as formal as Kubrick's style has been, I feel like it's you, you've arrived at kind of the most human place in his entire filmography. Um, you get to the last, I don't know, 15 minutes or so of Barry Lyndon, and maybe it's got something to do with the sheer amount of time you've spent or just that kind of haplessness of the character. But mm-hmm. it's like Stanley, this is how Stanley Kubrick expresses sympathy, you know? Not a word that you would often use, perhaps, in describing uh, the man who made Dr. Strangelove and, and Clockwork Orange, but... Uh, mm-hmm. But that's, I think that's what those of us who, who love the film uh, find moving about it, is that it's, you know, it's Kubrick, and he's, he's doing his, uh, you know, speaking through God's voice kind of thing, and yet there you are at the end, and um, you, you kind of have seen this, this human life go the course of so many human lives, and he's not going to nudge you to, to get out your handkerchiefs, but, but there is something quite touching about Barry's um, arc. Kubrick's film assumes the essential story elements from Thackeray's novel, cuts several passages, and adds its own embellishments. Perhaps the most significant of these changes lies in the narration. While the novel is narrated by Barry himself, Kubrick's film is voiced by an omniscient observer who comments on Barry's adventures, oftentimes revealing events before they even occur on screen. This device was in keeping with the ironic, godlike point of view that often characterized Kubrick's films. Barry had his faults, but no man could say of him 
that he was not a good and tender father. He loved his son with a blind partiality. He denied him nothing. It is impossible to convey what high hopes he had for the boy and how he indulged in a thousand fond anticipations as to his future success and figure in the world. But fate had determined that he should leave none of his race behind him and that he should finish his life poor, lonely, and childless. Critic Robert Horton. The presence of a narrator gives you that sense that somebody knows what's happened already and, you know, it's played out and uh, maybe you shouldn't get your hopes up too high. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I, people always, you know, there's that, that critical school of thinking that, that thinks that having a narrator is, is really lazy and, and kind of a shortcut. And sometimes that's true, but this is one of those movies that, that um, makes an awfully good case for, for having a narrator, because he's mm. one of the great narrators, I think, Michael Horton. The, the sound of his voice and, you know, the wryness of, uh, of what he says, um, uh, it's, it's, somehow it, it sets just the right tone. That's a really difficult balance between um, a sort of distanced um, quality and also the ability to, to have some sympathy with these, you know, foolish creatures who are enacting uh, their storylines. Director Neil LeBute. The narrator, Michael Horder, had a, a kind of wonderful, dry sense of humor about things. Um, it wasn't like Tom Jones, but it was, you know, it, it just felt right. And uh, it put things into a kind of perspective. And, and, and great people. I mean, there's some wonderful character actors in there in, in, in relatively small parts. Mm -hmm. Leonard Rossiter, I think, is, is fantastic in the movie. Um, Hardy Kruger, I like very much. Um, Patrick McGee is somebody I've always had an affinity for. Um, Murray Melvin plays uh, yes. Reverend Runt. Love him. But really fine work from, from Ryan O'Neill, I think. A really, really strong performance. Critic Robert Horton. Tell me about Ryan O'Neill, because this is another uh, criticism that I read of the film prior to watching it, uh, that he was kind of the ultimate blank Kubrick blank actor, uh, but I, I found him pretty delightful in, in the film for the most part, and, and, and I thought it was a very kind of understated but emotional performance personally. Yeah. But what, what was your take on that? Yeah, well, I it's I think Ryan O'Neill is one of my favorite things about the film, and it really makes the film work in in an, in a really special way for me uh, because to me. You know, you've got this guy, I mean, here's this great super production by the great, you know, filmmaking genius of, of that moment, and at the center of it is is a movie star that nobody ever called a great actor. I mean, even, even people who like Ryan O'Neill. Um, mm -hmm. And there's something about Ryan O'Neill and this sort of, you know, a, a actor who is from the second tier connecting with this character who is just stays a resolutely second rate character you know he he he's not a very good person really when it comes right down to it although he sort of gropes his way towards something by the end yeah. and i just think that a better actor a more skilled actor a more charismatic actor would not quite have made the special presence that Ryan O'Neill makes in this movie, and then in many ways, as you said, makes it kind of touching that this, you know, I said uh, he, he had a certain haplessness before the character mm -hmm. of, of Barry Lyndon, and I think Ryan O'Neill just, he expresses that perfectly, and he hits, hits the right note of uh, being sort of uh, game for whatever comes along. He's innocent enough in the beginning, and then when he kind of wises up and becomes more of a um, of a guy who's looking to rise in the world, um, he hits that note really well too. And, um, mm. It's just a wonderful, you know. You you imagine? I don't know who else was on the short list uh, uh, of actors, Jack Nicholson or somebody like that. And that that's that would have been all wrong. It just that was almost that would be too much energy for this particular you know Pilgrim's Progress. Professor of Film Studies at UCLA Berkeley. Steve Mamber. I actually think Ryan O'Neill is pretty terrific. 
in it because he's used uh, in such a pictorial way. He's, he's clearly doing exactly what Kubrick wants him to do, which is to become part of the visual landscape. Pre-production was always a long and arduous process on a Kubrick film. But given Kubrick's probing curiosity and meticulous attention to every detail, one can imagine that this was the period of filmmaking that he savored the most. He discussed his year-long pre-production on Barry Lyndon to acclaimed journalist Michel Simon. It, it is a little bit like a detective uh, looking for clues. Uh, on Barry Lyndon, I created a picture file of, uh, I don't know, thousands of, of uh, drawings and paintings for every type of reference uh, you know, that we could have wanted. I think I, I destroyed uh, every art book that you can buy in a bookshop by tearing the pages out and sorting them out. But uh, certainly tried to make it look like the paintings. You know. The costumes were all um, copied from paintings. I mean, none of the costumes were, quote, designed. I think this has become, you know, uh, the only, you know, a respectable, in fact, the only sensible way to do historical mm -hmm. costumes. It's, it's stupid to have a, a quote, a designer uh, interpret the 18th century uh, mm -hmm. as, as, a, as they may remember it from art school or from a few pictures they get together. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody could have the feeling, even if they academically um, studied it, no, nobody could have a feeling for designing clothes mm -hmm. out of their own period. Very few people have a feeling for designing clothes in their own period, you know. The authenticity of the costumes wasn't the only detail that obsessed Kubrick, as he and his team labored on crafting every aspect as faithfully as possible to the period, including the wigs, makeup, locations, and customs. But the primary area where the film pushed beyond the restrictions of the day was in the lighting. Ever the innovator and perfectionist, Kubrick had grown tired of the costume epics of the past, and as he did with all of his films, he set out to redefine that genre. He surmised that the artificiality he sensed in these films was due to the use of electric light, which was of course inauthentic to the period. To remedy this, Kubrick was determined to illuminate his film with only natural light and candlelight. The problem was, the technology did not yet exist to make this even a remote possibility. So Stanley did what he always did. He made it possible. Kubrick's longtime assistant, Leon Vitali. When we shot Barry Lyndon, I think Stanley shot on uh, the highest speed of color film then was, I think, was 50 ASA. Mm. You know, it's it, pretty, very slow by today's standards. And that was an improvement on, you know, 25 ASA. And what, what it meant, what, what that means is, you know, the, the speed of the film, you know, how fast it is in resolving an image, uh, it means you've got to crank up light in there to such an extent. And that was always the challenge is, you know, was how, you know, how much light you had to use, but how you could nuance it so that it took a beautiful picture and it took DOPs who really knew what they were doing. Kubrick's solution to this dilemma, coupled with the tremendous contributions of his genius cinematographer John Alcott, did nothing short of revolutionize the art form. Kubrick learned of an intensely high-speed lens manufactured by Zeiss exclusively for NASA. He devised an intricate plan to mount this lens to his camera. Working with cinema products Ed DiGiulio, the two managed to rig the lens to a BNC Mitchell 35mm camera, and the resulting images were glorious. Assistant Director Andy Armstrong. I remember everyone talking about it, and I remember thinking how cool that was, and how, you know, it, that, yes, that, that was certainly a wow moment, and it's odd now that you look back at it, that it is it's emulated in lots of pictures, and uh, it, it, yeah, it's absolutely beautiful, and, and very cutting edge in, in uh, and you know very risky and it's in terms of you know when you think you're on location so the dailies have to go away and get processed and come back and be seen and then it could have easily been uh, you know absolutely unwatchable assistant director brian w cook 
uh, that stuff did with all with the candlelight that did look terrific no mm. question about it although very difficult to shoot because of the very tiny depth of field that you had with those particular lenses you know yeah yeah and uh, of course they'd all they were all Stanley had them all fed the Julio fitted them all onto an old BNC camera so it was a very difficult job very difficult job for Dougie Milson who was the focus puller on that movie I mean that was very very tough film for him I mean did a fantastic job really because Stanley is very very tough on guys in those positions in fact he promoted both Johnny Alcott who used to be the uh, camera assistant on 2001 made him a cameraman on clockwork mm. and he promoted Dougie <clears throat> after The Shining and the Barry Lyndon to be the cameraman on Full Metal Jacket yeah one thing Stanley was terrific at is if he saw someone who was, he thought had potential uh, was young very enthusiastic hard working and had some talent he would give any young person a break in that role biographer Vincent Labruto this is one of my favorite Kubrick stories. He had a guy or a gal sit there with, with a journal book and make a chart of how the candles were burning down. Because the ones that were on camera, he wanted to make sure that there was no continuity mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Kubrick and his team also took their cues from paintings from the period. In fact, many of the images in the film were directly inspired by the masterworks of the 18th century. Kubrick's inventive use of slow zooms would focus on a particular section of his living painting and pull back, revealing a larger canvas, and making the viewer keenly aware of the frame. Critic Robert Horton but that, how does that speak to the the themes and the, and the characters in that film, do you think? The painterly aspect of it. The... Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, and it, it, I think it goes back to the idea that all of us, all of the characters, all of us by extension, are sort of playing these things out within a frame that we really have no control over and that um, is in some ways kind of predestined um, and and there's so many you know great you see great works of art in the movie and and uh, the, the movie itself is so carefully framed and so on um, that that's what that reinforces for me is there's a, mm. there's a kind of that aesthetic that it's that's at work there um, is in a, in a way reminding us of, of this frame that kind of hangs around Barry's life and uh, that he can't, he can't ever quite seem to be an, enough of a, an operator of his own to get out of, uh, even if he escapes his original situation in Ireland. He just goes, he tends to fall into the next thing that becomes mm -hmm. another sort of frame for him. Originally, Kubrick wanted to shoot the film using locations his team had uncovered in Ireland, but reputed threats from the IRA led he and his crew to return to England. Production on this vast and complicated film lasted more than 300 shooting days. Assistant Director Andy Armstrong. It was just a very, very large, slightly out of control movie, and and yeah, but largely because of uh, a lot, well, a lot, a lot anyway, because of uh, Stanley would change his mind a lot. Certainly now, as I look back, his his mode of operation was certainly to be the only one with some form of order in his own mind in a, in a sea of chaos. That's why you could never solve this chaos because it was being permanently, uh, permanently and intentionally created. He actually he really did quite like the chaos and the, uh, and the, the sort of ad lib, uh, you know, weirdness and oddity that came out of that. And you know, to a certain degree, that there's 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 some brilliance in that. Every day there would be at least two or three different call sheets, and an entire crew, a company that was huge, would wait to see if, depending on weather and light, whether we'd go to location A, B, C, or whether there would be a weather cover set and we'd go inside or whatever. You know, and it would all it would all be dependent on light and. Um, uh, weather conditions and 
uh, you know, one or two other factors, but mostly that because he, he he wanted to, he wanted the film really to be this this which it is in certain ways. There's a lot of a lot of beautiful images of uh, that look like watercolors or look like oil paintings, more like really. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But it, but that obviously caused you know it's a it's a it's a massive enterprise getting a huge company like that on the road every morning. But then to have tons of variations where you might have ten different actors and only three of them are in this scene, then the other two are in this scene, and, uh, the other you know three or four are in this scene, and some of them may overlap. So it'd be a question of when you got the when you you know before the days of cell phones and things. So it's uh, you, you know everyone waiting at a ho- at, uh, you know, half a dozen hotels waiting to get the call to see which location would be the one we'd go to. And sometimes there'd be such chaos in the mornings that you turn up at one location and half the crew and cast have gone to another location and it would be it would be midday before everyone got together. You know, there's, there's I mean at the time there's things that was incredibly frustrating and and especially for a young kid, you know, like I was, I'm mean, difficult to understand. But there was also some very funny moments too. I remember one day, you know, we were in the middle of nowhere in, in Ireland, some, you know, somewhere near Killarney, in the middle of, you know, beautiful rolling hills, and um, we're doing some in some scene with Ryan and uh, I can't think who else it was on the on the hill, and uh, suddenly this music, and it's uh, you know, it was something really in Congress, like David Bowie or something, you know. Mm. Suddenly came booming through the through the sort of whole landscape, and so everyone was sent off in every direction to find out what you know what the hell is making this. You know, this obviously has stopped the whole scene. After much you know searching, trying to find the source of the music, it was it was Stanley's wife. <laughs> <laughs> she had who painted had had the back door of the Volvo open was sitting on the tail you know sitting on the sort of back under the tailgate was painting with this music blaring and now it's taken it's taken you know a few minutes to find to find her to find the source of it and to tell her you know to turn it down and stop it or whatever I understand he's screaming mad you know basically you know where the hell you know who the hell was it you know they're sort of fire you know having killed or whatever you know who the hell was it? And eventually, you know, and, and, and Michael said, well, stop that. It's, it's okay, it's done. It's, it's over. No, I, you know, I want to know who it is. Who the hell was it? Who the hell, who the hell was, you know, who, who the hell was doing that noise? And eventually Michael had to say who it was. And Stanley mm. went, turned around and said, yeah, it's a, it's a catchy tune there. <laughs> <laughs> Assistant Director Brian W. Cook. Well, Barry Lyndon was really like a big adventure. Um, I mean, we started off in England, then we went to Ireland, then we left Ireland. Um, we came back to England. We sort of ran out of locations there and um, came back to England and shot in England. Then we went to Germany and shot the second unit. I went out there with Dougie Milsom and about seven crew, and then we picked up local crew, and we shot out there for about eight weeks. And... Um, you know, Stanley obviously didn't come with us on that, and we just shot shot a lot of second unit stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was very good in those days because there were no mobile phones, so Stanley could never. <clears throat> it felt very difficult to communicate with us, which was tremendous. So <laughs> we used to just go and shoot, shoot all the material that had been mapped out, and right. then we'd move on to the next location, and then he'd ring up us there and say, later and catch us, and tell us to go back and redo it, you know. Mm. So that, they were, that was a great fun on that film. I enjoyed that Germany more than anywhere. We had a really great time. Then we shot up in Scotland and Wales doing rumbies, and that was fun. Yeah, and, we, and that was a very, very good time, very relaxed time, with, you know, that sort of stuff. It had to Barry Lennon was a very tough movie to make. It wasn't an easy film. Like all those big period films are, mm. are tough to make, you know. I mean, there's... They're all exactly the same. It's the same old problem. Everyone has to be there half past four in the morning and getting everyone ready and the rain. And the, and particularly in places like Ireland, shooting the exteriors, you know, where you have a terrific problem with the light all the time and trying to control it. You know, it's so difficult. Yeah. So I was lucky enough to sort of be the first person to go out to Ireland with Ken Adam, the designer, and um, one of the art directors, 
and we flew out to Cork and then we uh, started uh, set up in Waterford and started scouting and then Stanley came over with the family and so I used to go out every day with um, Ken Adam and Stanley used to drive and uh, so we went for weeks looking at locations and sending photographers out all over the countryside uh, looking and photographing stuff and uh, so I got to know Stanley very well on all those trips so it was sort of an easy introduction for me on a very casual way rather than the sort of full on <coughs> working on a film set all day long. Leon Vitali portrayed Lord Bullingdon in Barry Lyndon and went on to assist Kubrick in each of his future films for the next 24 years. In those days, and we're talking, you know, the 70s, um, you know, every audition that one ever went to as an actor, it was usually a you met a director or a producer or both, and you took a 10 by 8 photo and a, and a CV or a resume, as you call it. You sat with them for like two minutes, and they took a look at your picture, and they took a look at your your resume, and, and that was your meeting, you know? And what Stanley did, and so you always dreaded them, because, you know, <laughs> what were you doing? Are you, are you trying to get on with them? Are you trying to be, you know... And they probably had an idea of what they were looking for in the first place. But what Stanley did was he he wasn't pre present at any of the auditions. Um, he had a casting director, and he was the first one, as far as I know, in, in the UK anyway, that used video as an audition tool. And he would send out, uh, he mailed the dialogue to anybody who's coming in for an audition a day to two days before with an instruction to learn it. And then you came in and they, you know, you were videoed doing the scene that had been given for you to do, which was the biggest, most wonderful release and relief, as mm -hmm. far as I was concerned as an actor, because he wasn't there. There was no one to try to impress in any other way but show what you can do as an actor. And, and that was all there was to it. And um, I got a call back and... Um, and then I, I got the role. And there was really one dialogue scene and a couple of peripheral, maybe one or two line scenes in it. And uh, and my schedule was um, 13 days over eight weeks. And it ended up mm. with many, many scenes. And I ended up there for eight and a half months. You'd rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse until he felt that the right emotional temperature and the right feeling of the scene was was happening and uh, and how he used to do that very often was you know he never knew how he was going to shoot a scene he just never knew it you know how he was going to do it when you walked on set so he would have you act the scene but if you thought you're going to sort of just trot your way through a rehearsal you know forget it he'd say do it the way you think you're going to do it. Do it for real, even in your rehearsal periods, you know, because you may give me a clue as to how I can actually start shooting this scene. You may give me an idea about where to where to start and what lens to use and how far away to set up, you know, the camera. Um, sim you know, so, so you kept on going through that process, and if something wasn't working, you could talk about and discuss it and you could say well it doesn't feel natural for me uh, to say it this way and he'd say he'd say well how would you say it then and so you'd go through this incredible process of getting it to that pitch where number one you'd, you weren't thinking about your dialogue in other words you know when he used to talk about um, knowing your dialogue and when he said knowing your dialogue what he meant by that, and what I think is 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 right as well, I always did, was that you should know your dialogue so well that that is not part of what's going through your brain when you're mm -hmm. acting the scene. Now, you should know it so well, you don't have to think about it. You right. know that it's just there in the back of your brain, and it's 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 you know the emotional core of what it is, the reason why you're there. That is the important thing to capture after that um, otherwise the dialogue has no meaning so yeah. you know it was it was like working with the stage director where for weeks and weeks you will analyze each scene 
down to the nth degree uh, before you come to an opening night. Whereas with Stanley, you know, if it took a day to get it right, just to shoot that little scene, you'd take a day. And sometimes we took two days. It was not uncommon for him, you know, to work that long on one scene. And, mm-hmm. and in actual fact, you know, well, the, the dual scene in the barn, for a start, that was two weeks, two and a half weeks, actually, um, mm. that it took to shoot that scene. But what I found was that because he was so willing to go through that process, it was a, a wonderful kind of uh, freedom for me, in actual fact. Mm-hmm. But what you do notice sometimes is that there's not a lot of uh, actors who are used to that. Um, there's a lot of actors who don't go through a drama school process, which doesn't I'm not saying it's better or worse. I'm just saying that, you know, some actors are natural screen actors or, or just natural actors who never go through that kind of process, whatever medium they work in most, you know. Um, so it can be scary for them, too, to be yeah. suddenly told, you can do whatever you like, let's see what you're doing, you know. And then, you know, to have it chip away and chip away and chip away and chip away to get it down to where, you know, it becomes interesting to watch and to look at and it does something for the scene and the movie as a whole. It yeah. can be just as terrifying the other way around. <laughs> I know it. I mean, I, I worked as a, you know, for Stanley, I used to work a lot with actors as a, as a kind of dialogue coach. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it was a very strange uh, process for them to go through. For some of them, you know, they would say, I've never done this like this before in my life, you know. And, mm. you, you know, you would have to keep on saying, well, let's just keep it, you know, keep patient and and let's do it the way he wants to do it, which is just to have you come on set and so free of any kind of mental process. Time just absolutely meant nothing. Barry Lyndon opened in the States on December 18th, 1975. While it performed well internationally, the film failed to ignite the U.S. box office. At the time, it might have felt, at least on the surface, out of fashion amidst the works that define the new Hollywood. But Kubrick was new Hollywood before there was a new Hollywood. And upon reflection, Barry Lyndon fit the mold of this exciting new form of American cinema to perfection. Kubrick reinvented the stale costume drama with wondrous innovation and a singular vision. Perhaps disappointed, but certainly undaunted by the commercial failure of Barry Lyndon, Kubrick resumed the patient but probing search for his next obsession. Eventually, he found it. But the world would have to wait five long years before Kubrick delivered his next shining masterpiece. Become a Patreon supporter of the Kubrick series and enjoy advanced access to future episodes and our complete archive of uncut interviews. Visit thekubrickseries.com or patreon.com slash thekubrickseries for more details.